Sally Morgridge. I'm a senior editor at Holiday House, and I'm here to welcome you to What's Up. Today, we are sharing a collection of books called Books for a Better Earth. They're packed with cool information to inspire kids like you to become active, knowledgeable participants in caring for our planet. If you've ever thought about becoming a scientist or ways that kids might help to protect the earth, these books are perfect for you. They are full of awesome activities and ways for you to take action. Did you know that goats can help prevent wildfires? Or that some types of seaweed have more calcium than milk? These books tackle big problems like air quality, coral reef disease, and plastic waste, and cover fascinating topics like garbage gobbling pigs, ancient drinking straws, and sunken aircraft carriers. There's something for every kind of reader, picture books, longer middle grade, and even a graphic novel. Books for a Better Earth remind us that there are some really amazing things happening around the world to counter the effects of climate change, and you can be a part of them. Today, we'll visit two book creators, Dana Allison Levy and Roxy Monroe, who will tell us about their books and share more cool facts and real world things you can do to help save the planet. First, let's meet Dana. She wrote Breaking the Mold, Changing the Face of Climate Science. It profiles 16 amazing scientists who are protecting our planet and working to make life better for future generations. Hi, Dana. Thank you, Sally. I'm so excited to be here and share Breaking the Mold, Changing the Face of Climate Science. This is a book that profiles 16 people, all scientists studying very different elements of science, from volcanoes to marine mammals, from atmosphere to climate, um, and who come from really diverse backgrounds into science and who really break the mold of who looks like a scientist and who belongs in science. So I talked to them about how they got into science, uh, their road into what they're studying, what they wish they had known, and what they would tell younger kids now, um, and what all of us, in, from scientists to non-scientists, can do to help save the planet. And I suspect many of you are wondering, well, what can we do, uh, especially if we're not a scientist, if we haven't gone to school for years and years to study these things. And the good news is that there is definitely something for everyone to do. The book includes some citizen science projects, which are really cool, like making a sechi disc to measure the clarity of the water to monarch butterfly way stations. There's all kinds of stuff. Plus, I profile some people who are not scientists, but who are also doing really cool work to help the planet. So I look forward to kids and uh, all kinds of readers finding this book and finding their own way into science. Um, and now I'd love to meet Roxy Monroe, who's the author and illustrator of A Day in the Life of a Desert. Hi, Roxy. Thanks, Dana. Hi, everyone. Have you ever wondered how hot you'd be if you lived in a desert? Deserts are hot, really dry places. Many folks think they're uninhabitable. There are cold deserts. The Antarctic is sometimes considered a cold desert, but my book is about the hot deserts. Uninhabitable? Not at all. Deserts are full of life. Thousands of species of animals, insects, many reptiles and lizards, lots of birds, owls, eagles, roadrunners, rodents like squirrels, many kinds of mice and rats, and even large mammals like wolves, deer, jaguar, jackrabbits, and even foxes live in them. And the vegetation, prickly pear cactus, bushes, trees, grasses grow in these extra dry places. Some cacti, like the giant cactuses in the Sonoran Desert, grow very slowly, like six inches a year, but can live 200 years. In this book, I show more than 100 animal species. You'll see which ones come out in the desert during the day, and then which ones, a whole new set of characters, come out at night. You can search through these pages. There's a seek and find game with hundreds of creatures to find. The answers to the seek and find game are in the back of the book, along with a lot of cool information about these creatures. I visited five of the six deserts in this book. The Chihuahuan, which is mainly in Texas and Mexico, which I love. I was born in Texas. It includes the Big Bend National Park on the Rio Grande. 
I visited twice and once saw a small herd of javelinas, which are black and white fur-covered pig-like animals. I saw them up close and personal. I also visited Death Valley, and yes, guys, it is hot. There are signs when you enter reminding you to carry water in your car and to fill your gas tank. It's very isolated. Death Valley is part of the Mojave Desert in California. The Sonoran Desert is in Arizona, California, and Baja, Mexico, and the Great Basin is the most northern desert, mountainous in areas, and it can get pretty cold sometimes. But many of the special plants and unique animals that live and thrive under what seems like harsh and inhospitable conditions are in trouble right now. Damage from increasing temperatures, global warming, diversion of water to towns and by dams, the rapid growth of human habitats like cities and towns, pollution and insecticide spraying, industries like farming, ranching, oil extraction and mining, human actions like hunting, poaching, collecting native plants and animals, and off-road vehicle use are serious problems. We have to deal with these issues so these deserts will survive. The animals and plants that live in an ecosystem are interconnected and they need each other. Some bats are pollinators for plants like cactus. Deserts are homes to more types of bumblebees, which we need for food and flowers than anywhere else in the world. But they are declining too. Animals and even plants are being driven higher up in the mountains to find cooler air. Some species are endangered and disappearing. Once animals go extinct, they are gone forever. What can you do to help? First, do not be discouraged. It's difficult to reverse some of the environmental issues we've mentioned, but there's really quite a lot that you can do. Here are a few ways you can help protect these magical environments. Do you like animals? Did you know that you can adopt a gray wolf virtually from the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum or the World Animal Foundation? Through the World Wildlife Fund, you can adopt other rare desert creatures, like a reclusive red fox, a cute pygmy rabbit, or a ringtail. You can adopt a real desert tortoise that can live with you. What would you name it? At home, you can help by reducing the amount of energy you use. You probably know some of these tricks, but they all make a difference. If it's cold outside, don't keep the heat in your home up too high. Put on a sweater or wear socks to stop using so much energy. If you go through a drive through and there's a line, ask if you can park and go inside instead of keeping the car running and using fuel while you wait in line. Walk or ride a bike when you can instead of getting a ride in a car. Make sure that the light bulbs in your home are all the new compact fluorescent lights which use so much less energy. Some nature organizations make it very easy to learn how to be politically active. They even have sample letters you can write to politicians and give you the addresses to send them to. The National Park Service has all kinds of fun programs for Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, artists, and citizen scientists of all ages. Books for a Better Earth makes it easy. They have all the websites and addresses to do these things. You students are the answer and you can do it. We are depending upon you. To let you know more about what you can do and more about these cool new books, look who's here, Alex from Holiday House. Tell us more. I'd love to, Roxy. So by now you've heard about a couple of the books in this collection, but we have so many more coming down the line. And the cool thing about Books for a Better Earth is that no matter what you're interested in, there's a book for you. Sometimes people think scientists only do one kind of thing. They wear a white coat, they work in a lab, they look in a microscope. But the truth is, there are lots of different kinds of ways to be a climate scientist, and scientists work on all different kinds of topics. For example, do you love dogs? Well, we have a book coming up about a team of climate scientists who are training dogs to be climate superheroes. These hardworking pups protect ecosystems by sniffing out harmful pests. Or maybe you're not a dog person, that's okay. Maybe you're more interested in plants. One of our books in this collection is about a team of ecologists who throw a birthday party every year for a 500-year-old tree as a way to teach the community about how to take better care of our forests. 
Are you interested in construction sites? In one of our books, you'll meet some architects who use climate science to design buildings that help the environment instead of harming it. Whatever you're into, we just know you'll find a book you love. And we hope you use these books to become better stewards of the Earth. And who knows, maybe one day we'll read a book about what you did to save the planet. Well, thank you all for listening today. Have, Have fun, fun reading! reading.